Hello everyone, Professor Vaibhosha here. Today I have come up with a complete lecture series on engineering cows, the most interesting and students all time favorite. Or rather I would just say, it is one of the most scoring sections of exam. Let me give you a brief. We will be starting with basics as usual, like what are engineering curves and its applications, what is meant by conics, classification of engineering curves, comparison of ellipse, parabola and hyperbola based on their eccentricity. Then we will be having complete understanding of each curve with its picture views and definitions and with some of its nomenclatures that we are going to use. These curves will include ellipse, parabola, hyperbola, cycloid, involute and Archimedean spiral. If you like my content and teaching style then share it with your friends and do not forget to like and subscribe to show your love and support. Let us begin. First, what are engineering curves and its application? So let us understand it by a definition. Some of the laws of nature when represented on graph are known as curves. Curves are used almost in all the disciplines of engineering as listed under. So it can be used in mechanical, automobile, civil, electrical, computer, IT, ICD, EC, as well as physics and aerospace. So let us first start with mechanical. So mechanical you can use it as property curves, characteristic curves, TV diagrams for designing of any mechanisms or in analysis of forces. If we talk about automobile engineering, we can use it as vehicle design. Profiling of vehicle based on lift and drag can be done by these curves. Car meter design, component designing and car headlamps design, you can use these curves. Now for civil discipline, construction of any buildings, bridges, dams, water tanks, cooling towers or interior and architectural elements can be made from these curves. Let us understand for electrical discipline. So understanding of electrical power or designing a circuit, plotting sine cosine waves and characteristic curves, you need this engineering curves. Now there are broader applications for computer IT, ICD and EC, which can be in computer graphics, artificial intelligence, neural network, as well as in robotics. Now in physics and aerospace, this cause can be used like path of earth around the sun, which can be said to be elliptical path. Now tracing the trajectories of space shuttle and rockets in space, we can use it by cause path of electrons around the nucleus. We can trace with once again by this engineering curves. So now let us see what is meant by conics. Now, so let us understand by definition, intersection of a cone by a cutting plane gives us various curves of intersections known as conics. So let us understand this definition by help of this picture representation. So before that, let us understand what do you mean by cone. So this triangular element is nothing but your cone. So at the bottom, of the cone, you can see this circle. So this is nothing but the base of the cone. This top point or which is the highest point of your cone is known as apex. Now this triangular lines, these lines constructing the triangular shape, these lines are nothing but the generators of a cone. So this is a generator as well as this is also a generator. So cone has have total three elements, base, generators and apex. So now let us understand this definition. Intersection of a cone by a cutting plane gives us 
various curves of intersection known as conics. So now we are having this cone. Now we are cutting this cone by this section plane vertically like this. And after cutting this cone, we are getting this section as our answer. So this triangular section is nothing but your intersection or cause of intersection, which is known as conic. So now let us understand different cases of conics. So case A, when cutting plane contains the apex, we get a triangle as a section. So now case A, when we are cutting this cone and our cutting plane contains apex. So this is our cutting plane. As you can see, this is our cutting plane, which contains apex. So we are having triangle as a section and this is nothing but your isosceles triangle. So whenever your cutting plane contains apex, you will be having section as your isosceles triangle or simply you can say a triangle. Now case B, when cutting plane is perpendicular to the axis or parallel to the base, in a right cone, we get a circle as the section. So let us understand this case B. So this is your cutting plane, which is now perpendicular to your axis. So this vertical line is nothing but your axis. So this cutting plane is now perpendicular to axis. At the same time, this cutting plane is also parallel to the base. So you will get a section as circle, as you can see. So when your cutting plane is perpendicular to your axis and it is parallel to base, you will be having circle as a section. Now case C, when the cutting plane is inclined to the axis, but not parallel to the generator, we get an ellipse as the section. Let us understand this case C. So when your cutting plane is inclined to your axis, you can see it is inclined at certain angle to the axis, but it is not parallel to either of the generator this generator or this generator. So it is not parallel to either this generator or either this generator. So you will be having your section plane as ellipse, as you can see. Now, when the cutting plane is inclined to the axis and parallel to one of its generators, then we get parabola as the section. So whenever your cutting plane is inclined to the axis, obviously you can see it is inclined to the axis, but at the same time, it must be parallel to one of its generators. So it is a generator, one of the generator of the cone. And you can see this line and this cutting plane both are parallel to each other. So at the moment when your cutting plane is inclined with your axis, at the same time it is parallel to one of the generators, you will be getting parabola as your section. Now let us understand case E. When the cutting plane is parallel to the axis, we get hyperbola as the section. So this is your cone and this is your center axis. Now when your cutting plane is parallel to the center axis and it is cutting vertically like this, you will be getting this section cutting plane as your hyperbola. So it was very easy. Here you have cone and in each case you are trying to cut this cone by various position of your cutting plane and whichever the shapes you are getting is known as your curves of intersection or you can also call them as conics. Now let us move ahead. Classification of engineering curves. So engineering curves can be broadly classified into six categories. So let us start with first conics, cycloidal curves, involute, spiral, helix, and sine cosine waves. So now let us start with first conics. So conics can be further classified into or divided into five categories, triangle, circle, ellipse, parabola, and hyperbola. Now ellipse can be drawn by either of these eight methods. One, arc of a circle method. Two, concentric circle method. Three, loop method. Four, oblong method. Five, ellipse in parallelogram method. Six, Premel method. Seven, parallel ellipse method. Eight, directrix focus method. Now, for parabola, you can use either of these four methods to draw your parabola. First, rectangle method. Second, parabola in parallelogram method. Third, tangent method. Fourth, directrix focus method. Now, you can utilize one of these five methods to draw your hyperbola. First, rectangular hyperbola. Second, oblique hyperbola. Third, hyperbola by intersection method. 
foci and voltaicis method while directrix focus method now let us move to next curve cycloidal curves so it can be further subdivided into three categories cycloid epicycloid and hypocycloid now cycloid can be further subdivided into inferior trochoid and superior trochoid likewise epicycloid can also be further subdivided into inferior epitrochoid superior epitrochoid now for the case of hypocycloid can also be divided into two categories inferior hypotrochoid and superior hypotrochoid now let us move to next curve involute so involute can be involute of a circle or involute of a polygon polygon means triangle square pentagon hexagon so you will be having involute of a triangle involute of a square like that now spiral so spiral can be divided into three categories archimedean spiral logarithmic spiral and spiral for clock semicircle quarter circle now helix you can have helix of a cylinder or you can have helix of a cone and finally you will be having cosine and sine waves this type of curves we are usually dealing them in electrical or electrical communication subjects so now let us move ahead comparison of ellipse parabola and hyperbola based on eccentricity so now let us first understand what do you mean by this word eccentricity so we will be defining by one definition so eccentricity can be defined as the ratio of distances of a point from a fixed point also known as focus and a fixed straight line also known as directrix so once again eccentricity can be defined as the ratio of distances of a point from a fixed point and a fixed straight line so it can be mathematically defined as e eccentricity e is equal to distance of a point from a fixed point or a focus divided by distance of a point from a fixed straight line also known as directrix so we can further simplify them as eccentricity e is equal to pf by op now let us understand this eccentricity more clearly by this graphical representation so this is your ellipse this shape is your elliptical shape this is known as ellipse this second curve is your parabola and third curve is your hyperbola so now we will first define eccentricity for ellipse by our definition so definition says that it is the ratio of the distances of a point so let us first define the point for this ellipse first so this is let us suppose any point on ellipse as point p so now it is the ratio of distances of this point so we will find out the distance of this point from fixed point that means pf the ratio of distance of fixed point from a fixed point this is pf and divided by the distance of this point from a fixed straight line which is po or op you will be having eccentricity which is defining your ellipse so once again for ellipse distance of a point from a fixed point so this is your point and its distance from a fixed point is pf so we have put this pf here divided by distance of a point from a fixed straight line so this is your fixed straight line also known as your direct axis vertical line so distance of your point p from your fixed straight line which is nothing but your op distance so let us divide this pf by op you will be having this as your eccentricity e and in the case of ellipse you will be having eccentricity less than 1 now let us define eccentricity for this second curve parabola so now let us first take any point p on this parabola so now eccentricity e is equal to distance of a point from a fixed point so this is your point and the distance of this point from a fixed point that means your focal point so pf would be your distance so let us put this pf divided by distance of a point from a fixed straight line or a directrix so this is your point and its distance from a fixed straight line or directrix is vertical line so this will be your po so let us divide it by p 
PF by OP or you can also say PO. So which will give you ascendancy for parabola. So once again, the distance of this point from fixed point, which is PF, divided by distance of this point with respect to its directrix, which is OP. So PF by OP, which is nothing but your ascendancy E. And in this case of parabola, your ascendancy E is equal to one, or you can say unity. Now let us understand ascendancy for this hyperbola. So for that, we must specify any point on this hyperbola first. So we have taken this point P on the hyperbola. Now let us use this equation. Ascendancy E is equal to distance of a point from a fixed point. So this is your point. Is distance from a fixed point. That means your focal point, which is nothing but your PF distance. So we have put this PF here. Divided by distance of a point from a fixed straight line, or you can say directrix. So distance of your point from a fixed straight line, which is nothing but your OP. So let us divide it PF by OP. You will be having this final ratio as ascendancy DE. And in this case of hyperbola, your ascendancy D is greater than one. So now we have defined this ascendancy D for three of the terms, ellipse, parabola, and hyperbola. Now let us compare these three ellipse, parabola, and hyperbola based on the eccentricity now. So now, as you can see, ellipse is having eccentricity which is less than one. For parabola, eccentricity is exactly one, or you can say unity. And for hyperbola, your eccentricity is always greater than one. So this is the major difference between all of these curves, which defines their shape. So this is your eccentricity one, less than one. So when you are having eccentricity less than one, you will be having this curve as your elliptical curve. When your eccentricity is exactly one, you will be having this curve. This will be your parabola. And when your eccentricity is greater than one, you will be having one much broader curve. This is known as your hyperbola. Now let us understand some of the nomenclatures of this curve. So first we'll start with ellipse. So in ellipse, you will always have two axes. One is called as a major axis, which is defining the maximum distance of your ellipse. And another is your minor axis. Secondly, ellipse always have two focal points and which are known as foci. Now, the farthest point of the ellipse are known as vertex. So this is known as a vertex for ellipse on the left hand side as well as on the right hand side. This is also known as a vertex. Now, let us define for parabola. So farthest point of a parabola is known as your vertex. And you can say your parabola always starts from your vertex. So this is your vertex. Now for the case of hyperbola, let us uh, define the case for hyperbola. So the farthest point of this uh, hyperbola, or you can say from the point at which your hyperbola starts, this is known as your vertex point, which is the starting point of your hyperbola. From this hyperbola starts and extends from both the sides. These are known as vertex points for your uh, hyperbola, parabola, and your ellipse, which are, in other words, are starting points of ellipse. Now, next, this vertical line, it is known as directrix. As we know, if in movie, we have one director which guides the whole movie. So in this case, there is one directrix which guides the motion of this point for these three of the cases to generate this ellipse parabola and hyperbola. So we must have this vertical line, which is known as directrix. So in any of these curves, we will be having three terms. First, focal points. Second, vertex points. And third, directrix. So now, let us move ahead. Let us define first ellipse. So ellipse, definition. It is the locus of a point which moves in a plane so that the ratio of its distances from a fixed point and a fixed straight line is a constant and which is less than one. That means we can say eccentricity is less than one, like we have seen in previous, uh, previous diagram. So it is a locus of a point which moves in a plane so that ratio of its distances from fixed point PF and fixed straight line OP is less than one for this ellipse. Locus means it is the path traced out by number of points and when we have 
number of points located and we try to join this number of points by a smooth straight line will be having this locus traced out and which is known as ellipse locus means it is a group of points so here we will be having number of points here on the elliptical profile and if we try to join these points by a smooth line we will be having one curve which is known as ellipse of course now next definition or we can have on another definition like it is the locus of a point which moves so that the sum of its distances from fixed points called as focal points or foci is a constant and this sum of distances is equal to the major axis of the ellipse or you can say major axis ab so let us understand this definition by this diagram so it is the locus of a point so it is a group of point locus means group of points which moves in a plane so that it moves in a plane so that sum of its distances from sum of its distances its distances means your distance of any point which is known as sum of its distances from focal point so let us take for example p1 point so sum of this distances of this p1 point from this focal point f1 and focal point f2 which can be defined as p1 f1 plus p1 f2 which is the sum of its distances from focal point 1 the distance is p1 f1 and the distance of this p1 from focal point 2 is your p1 f2 so sum of its distances is equal and it is constant for any of the points like p2 if we can define so p2 f1 plus p2 f2 likewise we can define for any number of point which must be a constant and the sum of this distance is equal to the major axis of an ellipse so if we find out the sum of the n number of points taken on this ellipse then it would be exactly equal to the major axis ab of the ellipse so it is a major axis so let us define this major axis as ab if we find out the sum of the points sum of the distance of the points from the focal point f1 as well as focal point f2 which can be defined by p1 f1 plus p1 f2 which is p1 f1 plus p1 f2 for any number of points it will be exactly equal to ab or major axis so we can write down mathematically mathematically p1 f1 plus p1 f2 is equal to for any point p2 f1 plus p2 f2 and we can say for any points is equal to ab and which is equal to major axis now we can also say so let us define this vertical minor axis as a point c and d so if we take our points final point at point c so the summation or the sum of the distances of this point c would be c f1 plus c f2 we can define for this point c c f1 plus c f2 likewise we we can define this sum of the distances for point d like df1 plus df2 so we can write down df1 plus df2 which can also be equal to your major axis and ab because your point c is one of the points of your ellipse so we can define as cf1 plus cf2 is is equal to df1 plus df2 which is equal to ab which is equal to your major axis from this previous equation now further we can simplify as as we know your point c is at equal distance from your o like your point d so your point c and point d are equal distance from your point o so we can say that c point would be at the equal distance from your f1 as well as at the equal distance from your f2 so your c point would be at the same distance away from your f1 as well as same distance away from your f2 so we can define as cf1 is equal to cf2 and which would be same for point d point d would be at the same distance away from your f1 as well as it is same distance away from your f2 and as we know point c is equal distance from your o and point d is also equal distance from your o so we can say that for d also df1 is equal to df2 and we can say cf1 is equal to cf2 is equal to df1 is equal to df2 and 
by putting this value of this equation in this previous equation we can have cf1 plus in the place of cf2 we can put on the place of cf2 we can put cf1 once again so we can have cf1 plus cf1 which will be 2 cf1 and 2 cf1 would be equal to your ab so we can have finally cf1 is equal to cf2 is equal to 1 half ab or similar in the case of this df1 is equal to df2 so let us solve this case so df1 plus in the place of df2 we can always put df1 so let us substitute here df1 plus df1 so we will be having 2 df1 which is equal to ab so if we want to find out the df1 so df1 which is equal to ab by 2 or 1 by 2 ab so we will be having 1 by 2 ab as your df1 and df2 so which says that which is a half of your major axis so this is your important result you have to remember this result cf1 is equal to cf2 is equal to df1 is equal to df2 and which is equal to one half ab or you can say one half major axis how you get this equation so you have to just simply put the cf1 is equal to cf2 in this equation so you will be having 2 cf1 is equal to ab and dividing this 2 below this ab so you will be having cf1 is equal to one half ab so we will be having cf2 is equal to one half ab so now for simple case of df1 and df2 you can follow the same process here and you will be having final answer as 1 by 2 ab and 1 by 2 major axis so you have to remember this equation cf1 is equal to cf2 is equal to df1 is equal to df2 which is equal to 1 by 2 ab or 1 by 2 major axis so now let us move ahead applications of ellipses you can have following applications like shape of a manhole shape of tank in a tanker flanges of a pipe gland and stuffing boxes shape used in bridges and arcs monuments path of earth around the sun shape of trays and you can see different applications here as well so these are the various application of your ellipses now let us move to parabola so definition it is the locus of a point which moves in a plane so that its distances from a fixed point or a focus and a fixed straight line are always equal so let us understand it by this figure so it is a locus of a point locus means groups of a point so it is a locus of a point which moves in a plane so that its distances from fixed point p1f and fixed straight line p1b which are equal and which are always constant so this is nothing but the definition of your parabola another definition we have one another definition ratio known as eccentricity you know eccentricity right we have defined it in the previous sections so now ratio of its distances from focus to that of the directrix is constant and which is equal to 1 so you can say eccentricity of the parabola is equal to 1 so we have already defined this eccentricity eccentricity in previous section so if your eccentricity is 1 then it must certainly be your parabola so let us uh, once again let us understand the nomenclature so this is your axis of parabola this is your focal point or focus you can see it by f this is your vertex point or starting point of your parabola and this vertical line is your directrix which governs the motion of these points on this parabola to generate this curve so applications of parabola so these are the applications of parabola motor car headlamp reflector sound reflector and deflect detector bridges and arch construction path of particle thrown at any angle with earth so this is your antenna receiver station or this is your parabolic disc which is relaying your communication network like your tv channels or your space signals this is your parabolic throw collector or reflector which reflects the light of the sun to have this energy stored into your any different form this is your light and this is the most important case so here suppose there is one player which is throwing a ball or rugby you can see this is a one angle at which the ball is thrown so this curve generated by this 
motion of this rugby or this ball is known as parabola. So now let us move ahead for hyperbola. Definition. It is the locus of a point which moves on a plane so that the ratio of its distances from a fixed point and a fixed straight line or a directrix is constant and it is greater than 1. You can see eccentricity is greater than 1. So that we have learned previously for the case of hyperbola we have eccentricity greater than 1. So whenever you are having eccentricity greater than 1 your curve would definitely be your hyperbola. Now let us define one more definition. It is the curve generated by a point moving in a plane so that the difference of its distance is from two fixed points called foci is a constant and it is equal to the distance between two vertices. So let us first define this focus and vertices. So this is your double hyperbola. This is your conjugate axis. This is your transverse axis. You are having two hyperbola. That means you will be having two sets of vertex and focus. So this is your focus number two. This is your vertex number 2, V2. This is your vertex number 1, V1. And this is your focus number 1, F1. So let us define this curve. So it is generated by a point. So let us first take, for example, this is generated by this point P1, which moves in a curve in a pattern that the difference of a distance from this focus point. So P1, F1 minus P1, F2. So P1, F1 minus P1, F2. Sorry, P1 F2 minus P1 F1. So P1 F2 minus P1 F1, which is the dis difference of the distances from two fixed points, is constant as you can see, which is constant, which is 2A. And this constant is equal to the distance between two vertices. So this distance between two vertices, that means the distance between this V1 and V2. So let us define this distance between V1 and V2 as 2A. So we can say that. It is a curve generated by a point moving in a plane so that difference of this point from these two fixed points like P1 F2 minus P1 F1. So P1 F2 minus P1 F1 which is nothing but a constant 2A and which is equal to the difference between or distance between two vertices V1 and V2 and which is always constant. So once again it is curve generated by a point moving in a plane so that the distance of two focuses means P1 F2 minus P1 F1 which is constant which is equal to 2A and which is equal to the distance between two vertices V1 and V2 and which is always constant. So you have to remember this equation for this hyperbola which can be used further in our examples, one of the examples. So you have to remember this equation. Here the distance between two vertices is 2a and the distance between two foci is 2c. So distance between v1 and v2 we can say 2a and distance between f1 and f2 we can define it by 2c. So here p1 f2 minus p1 f1 is equal to constant and is equal to v1 v2 and is equal to constant. So now applications of hyperbola. So these are few applications of hyperbola. Nature of the graph of Boyle's law shape of overhead tanks, water tanks and shape of cooling towers. So these are your cooling towers. You can see the shape of these cooling towers. This is the broadest curve and this is known as your hyperbola. And this is your overhead tanks and these are few more applications of your hyperbola. Now let us move to next curve, cycloid. Definition. When one curve rolls over another curve without sliding or slipping, the path traced out by any point on the rolling curve is called as cycloid. So now let us simplify this curve cycloid. So you can easily correlate by word cycle. So let us understand this is one of the wheels of the cycle and this is its valve from which we are filling up the air. So let us understand whenever your wheel rotates or the straight path or your road surface so now, if you try to trace the path of this valve tube, then it will give one curve. This is a red curve and this curve is nothing but your cycle. So in cycle, we will understand now certain nomenclatures. 
so now let us understand your wheel moves for one complete rotation or revolution so it will travel in the one term the distance is equal to the distance of pi d you can see this is the total distance traveled by the rotation of this wheel for one complete revolution so one one complete revolution it will travel on this line the distance of total distance of pi d or 2 pi r you can see so this is nothing but your directing line which directs the motion of this wheel over this line second this is your rolling circle or generating circle so this is your circle which actually rolls over the straight line so this is known as your rolling circle it can also be known as your generating circle why this generating circle because with the help of this circle we are having this cow generated so it is nothing but your generating circle here now this arrow shows the rotation direction of this wheel so it rotates in clockwise direction so that's why this arrow shows the rotation is in clockwise direction now this cow is known as cyclone so we can define this cow as cyclone so these are the points which are the locus you can see that this is the locus of a point p1 to pa and if we try to join these points by a smooth curve we will be having the final curve which is known as your cycloid so this is the representation of cycloid for one complete revolution of this wheel over this directing line for the complete distance travel is equal to pi d or 2 pi r which is a circumferential distance travel by this circle now next involute so let's define involute first if a straight line is rolled around a circle without slipping or sliding any point on a line will trace out a curve which is called an involute let us suppose this is your circle and this is your straight line string or any straight line which will be rolled around this circle so these are the different position of your straight line and it is rolling around your circle and if you try to trace out the end point of this line so you will be having this red curve which is nothing but your involute now let us understand one more definition involute of a circle is a curve traced out by a point of a tight swing unwound or wound from or on the surface of the circle so let us understand so this is your circle and you are trying to wind this string around this circle or we are trying to unwind this string around the circle and at this process if we try to just trace out the end point of this string so we will be having these points as your end points of your string during your winding or unwinding operation of your string around your circle so let us suppose this is your string so if, as you try to wind this string so it length gets wound on this circle so you will be having lesser length of this string in each of the rotation you wound around this circle and finally you will be having this string completely wound around this circle at this point so you will be having starting point of your curve at this point p which is showing the maximum length of the string and at the end of this string you will be having this as a point on the circle because your string is now completely wound around the circle now one more definition we are having for this involute involute of a polygon is a curve traced out by a point on a tight string unwound or wound from or on the surface of a polygon we might have involute of a square pentagon hexagon etc so if we try to replace this circle by any shape like square pentagon hexagon and we try to follow this procedure of winding the string or unwinding the string so we will be having the same type of curve which is here known as involute of a polygon so now let us just understand few of the nomenclatures of polygon so in nomenclature of polygon we will be having one string or one straight line which is of exactly same length of the circumference of the object so here if we are having our object as circles so we will be drawing this string is equal to pi d length let us suppose if we are having a square so circumference of square would be 4 into length 4l would be the circumference of your square so we will be taking the 4l length of this string or this line now if we are having circle we will be dividing this circle into eight number of equal parts or we will be dividing the circumference of the circle into eight number of equal parts and now as we know we are winding this string over this circle of the circumferential length pi d so now if we have divided this circle circumferential length of the circle into eight parts then we must divide this 
circumferential length of the string also into equal parts of eight numbers because we have divided into circle into eight parts so that's why we have to compulsively divide this circumferential length into eight parts and that we'll see in subsequent lectures then we'll try to solve the examples for inward let us move ahead archimedean spiral so this is nothing but an archimedean spiral so let us first define the spiral it is the curve generated by a point moving uniformly along a straight line while line swings or rotates about a fixed point with uniform angular velocity so now let us suppose that this is a fixed point about which this line this dark line which will tend to rotate so it will here in this case it will be rotating in the anti clockwise direction so whenever your line rotates around this fixed points you will be having one point which is sliding over this line which is either sliding from outside to inside or inside to outside and here we will be having two combined motion first is the rotational motion with combined movement of your point linearly so whenever we are tracing the two simultaneous motion linear motion or or of point over this line as well as the rotational portion of this link itself will be having one curve generated which is known as your archimedean spiral so let us define once again by another definition it is a curve traced out by a point which moves uniformly both about the center as well as at the same time away or towards the center so simply if i give you one example so let us understand this is your fan hub this is your fan hub this is your fan this is your hub now let us suppose this is the center of your fan hub and there is one inset at the outer periphery of your circle now let us understand if this insect wants to get to the center so it, it tries to move along this straight line so now whenever it tries to move along this straight line at the same time let us assume that your fan is rotating in anti clockwise direction so your fan hub will also rotate in anti clockwise direction so this insect will face two uh, two rotations or two motion simultaneously first is linear motion towards its center which is your linear motion at the same time your fan is rotating in anti clockwise direction so your insect will also notice the rotational motion so whenever in any of the cases you are having the combination of linear motion along the straight line as well as the rotational motion along the circular path you will be having this curve generated which is nothing but your archimedean spiral so let us suppose in this case we are having a straight line fixed at the point and it is moving around the point so this is your fixed point this is your straight line which is moving around the circle so straight line in which we are tracing one point which is moves from outer periphery to inner periphery at the same time your line is moving with the angular velocity constant angular velocity in anti clockwise direction so we are having the combination of two motion linear motion of this point along this straight line at the same time your point is also moving in this circular pattern in anti clockwise direction because your circle is moving so the combination of these movements will be having this point location path traced out by this point in this fashion and this is your spiral and this is nothing but your spiral known as your archimedean spiral so it is very easy whenever your point revolves around any point fixed point and facing two motions linear as well as rotational will be having this archimedean spiral so this was all so now i would be happy to know about the places or things which you know are designed based on the curves we just learned 